July 10th, 1943. When you think of the Nazi German genocides, you probably don't immediately think of the satellites that make sure your phone works properly in 2022. But they are connected because modern rocket science became practical through the murder of tens of thousands of victims of Nazism. This week, the foundation for that is forged inside a bunker complex deep inside a forest in East Prussia. Here's a word from the Time Ghost Army. Never forget. Never give up. Never surrender. Join the Time Ghost Army. This is War Against Humanity, a series of World War II in real time. I'm Spartacus Olson. Last week, we saw that while in British India, Bengal, famine continues to worsen, Viceroy Litlingo isn't convinced that there's actually a significant lack of food. In Japan, plans were being made to force Japanese culture, religion, and language on all the minorities in the empire. At the Nazi comp complex Auschwitz, four new gas chamber complexes, or crematoria, were operational, raising the murder capacity of the Birkenau camp alone to 1.7 million individuals per year. The SS were given free reign to use the Gestapo to speed up the deportation across occupied Europe of Jews to be murdered. In France, large parts of the leadership of the resistance, including its leader Jean Moulin, were imprisoned being brutally tortured by that same Gestapo, but remained silent. Now transferred to the Gestapo in Paris, the torture continues. But as his sister, Laurent Moulin, will conclude, Jeered at, savagely beaten, his head bleeding, his internal organs ruptured, he attained the limits of human suffering without betraying a single secret, he who knew everything. On the 8th, the Gestapo give up and decide to send him to Berlin, but the torture has left him too badly wounded and he will not survive the train ride. With the other captives still at the mercy of the Gestapo or on their way to concentration camps, the French resistance has, for all practical purposes, been decapitated. It will launch another series of internal power struggles, which leader of the Free French, General Charles de Gaulle, will try to preempt with a split leadership, with one of his deputies, Claude Bouchinet Serreuil, overseeing actions in the northern zone, and Jacques Mangin, who set up the Free French Intelligence Service back in 1942 in charge of the southern zone. We shall see how that develops, but it is safe to say that the French resistance, crucial to the 1944 United Nations invasion plans, is for the time being at reduced capacity. The Free French are not the only force fighting for liberation, facing challenges by loss of leadership this week. On July 5th, Prime Minister of Poland in exile and Inspector General of the Polish Armed Forces, Polishlav Sikorski, is on his way back from an inspection of Polish forces in the Middle East. He's traveling with his daughter, Chief of Staff, and seven others. As the plane takes off from the Gibraltar airstrip, something goes wrong and it crashes into the sea after 16 seconds of flight. Only the pilot survives the crash. Sikorski has been the glue holding the Western allies to the Polish cause. Since the revelations this past April of the Soviet massacres of Poles at Katyn in 1940, he has been under internal criticism for not being hard enough in handling diplomacy about the Soviet crimes and external criticism for being too hard in his demands for condemnation of the Soviets by the other allies. Inside the Polish armed forces, some officers have gyrated towards a possible rival leader, Kazimierz Sosnowski, a hardliner in USSR foreign policy. In March, the MI6 even reported rumors of an impending coup. If General Sikorski pays a visit to the Middle East, he will be assassinated by a group of pro sosnowski extremists, although General Paskiewicz, commander of the Polish Armored Brigade in Iraq, take these rumors seriously, it is very doubtful whether anybody else would. The whole thing is nothing more than the usual Polish storm in a teacup. There is also the possibility that the Soviets want him out of the way, rumors that decades later will get a new life when it becomes clear that the head of MI6 counterintelligence in Gibraltar, Kim Philby, is a Soviet agent. 
Nevertheless, the RAF investigation concludes on July 7th that although they are unable to determine the cause of the crash firmly, they can rule out sabotage. Instead, it is likely that the cargo on board was poorly secured and shifted towards the tail of the plane, causing a critical stall during initial ascent. Now, Sikorsky is not just the leader of the Polish in exile, he is central to the Polish home army and resistance. He is for all practical purposes the commander-in-chief in exile of the Armia Krajowa, the underground home army in occupied Poland. With his standing with the other United Nations allies, he has functioned as an effective conduit of intelligence and direction for the women and men organizing themselves in preparation of liberation and already carrying out armed resistance and sabotage. Thus, his demise has a similar effect on the Polish war effort at home as the loss of Moulin has on the French. It opens up a can of worms of internal strife and eliminates the clear steering hand at a crucial moment. While the French and Polish resistance suffer setbacks, the Greek resistance continues to pick up speed. As we have seen, the Greek resistance forces of Ilas and Edes have been liberating rather large swaths of rural lands from Italian occupation in central Greece. However, like in many parts of occupied Europe, the resistance is fragmented along the lines of left and right wing sympathizers. These conflicts between the various Greek partisan movements have led the British military and special operations executive to hesitate in fully committing their support on the ground. But this week, on July 5th, after months of deliberations, the National Bands Agreement is signed by representatives of Elas, Edes, Eka, and the British Military Mission. A joint general headquarters of partisans is created, uniting the resistance under the one banner. That said, the agreement cements some of the conflicts by granting geographic autonomy to the groups, and at times reads as a text based on mutual suspicion rather than cooperation. For instance, all partisan groups in the lowlands will respect the right of the partisan groups of the mountains to gather food supplies from the lowlands, and no partisan of any group will be barbarically treated or be detained indefinitely or executed without proper trial and without the full knowledge of the nearest officer of the British military mission. The agreement is an important part to make sure that several operations proceed without glitches and immediately. Operation Animals is a series of sabotage assassinations and diversion actions. Eddie Myers, head of the British military mission in Greece, reports that during Operation Animals, 44 important sabotages took place, including 16 sabotages against railways. On Crete, in Operation Albumen on July 4th and 5th, the partisans cooperate with the British Special Boat Squadron, SBS, and an SAS group to sabotage the airfields at Heraklion, Castelli, Timpaki, and Malami. The reason these operations are so important and time-sensitive is that they are part of the diversion tactics to trick the Germans into believing that the invasion of southern Europe is going to go to Sardinia and then Greece, not Sicily, then Italy, as is the actual plan. Both Astrid and Indy have covered this in Spies and Ties and the Weekly War episodes in the past weeks. A list is in the description. The prize of the diversion is, however, in Greek civilian lives. The Germans carry out reprisals all over Greece, like on Crete, where 62 inhabitants of Heraklion are picked at random and executed, or on July 2nd, when 50 random civilians are executed along the railway line from Leptorkaya to Litorcho. As this week ends, the reprisals have not. But as you will have seen in Astrid's second episode about Operation Mincemeat, the ruse works, and several divisions are diverted to Greece under leadership by none other than Erwin Rommel himself. However, it is not only the Germans who are fools. To maintain the secrecy of the diversions, neither the murdered civilians nor the partisans know what they are dying and fighting for. They too believe that the liberation of Greece is now imminent. For the West, the civilians also feel the effect of a coming invasion, but here it is the other way around. The Axis erroneously think that this is the diversion. The people of Sicily are now in the direct line of fire for the coming invasion, while the actual planned landing zones are spared. On the 8th, Catania is targeted by American Liberator bombers dropping 110 tons of bombs on the city. 
On the 9th, 120 tons are dropped on Comiso, causing massive destruction. But once again this week, the brunt of United Nations bombing activities are not aimed here at what British Prime Minister Winston Churchill has called the soft underbelly of occupied Europe, but at the very heart of steel of the German Reich, the Ruhr. After last week of devastation on Cologne, Arthur Harris bombers returned there twice this week. On the night from July 3rd to July 4th, 653 bombers target industry on the left bank of the Rhine, destroying 20 industrial premises and 2,200 residential houses. 72,000 lose their homes, 1,000 are injured, and 588 killed. On the 8th, 288 aircraft come again, dehousing 8,000 people and killing 502. Numbers that do not include an unknown number of Allied POW and German soldiers that are struck at a nearby artillery barracks. In a fortnight, three bombing raids have now reduced the 2,000-year-old city of Cologne and its immediate surroundings into rubble. In total, 350,000 people are homeless. About half of Cologne's pre-war population and almost all of its wartime population, and more than 5,000 people have been killed. The Germans try to retaliate, but at this point there is not much force they can spare with the way they are conducting their war. On July 9th, 10 Luftwaffe bombers try to bomb London, causing limited damage. One of the bombers gets separated from the formation, though, and instead drops its ordnance on East Grinstead in Sussex, destroying the town hall, a pub, and a hardware store. Two of the bombs, with 50 kilos and 500 kilos of explosives, hit the cinema, where 184 people are watching a western, many of whom children. 235 people are injured and 108 killed. It is clear to the Germans, especially German Führer Adolf Hitler, that to regain the competitive edge in this deadly game of vengeance on vengeance, for vengeance, for vengeance, they will need some new shiny toy, a bringer of death that can pierce the British armor and strike at the island's heart without diverting fighting forces from the eastern and soon southern fronts. For years, the German army has been developing a ballistic missile in their research facilities at Peenemünde on the Baltic coast. A rocket. And now they're close to completion. So far, 30 such test missiles have been launched with varying success. Until now, Hitler has paid the project's passing and many times faltering attention. On July 7th of this week, General Walter Dornberger and Dr. Werner von Braun, military and technical heads of the German Army rocket program, arrive at the Führer's headquarters, the Wolfschanze, in East Prussia, to show off the capabilities of their rocket. They show him a film showcasing a successful launch on October 3, 1942, of the A-4 rocket, during which the researchers claim the rocket reaches the edges of outer space. Hitler is stunned. According to Don Berger's memoirs, Hitler exclaims his regrets of not having seen the potential earlier. Why was it I could not believe in the success of your work? If we had had these rockets in 1939, we should never have had this war. Well, in 1939, the weapon was little but an idea on paper, definitely not operationally possible. It still hardly is, but swept up by its lethal possibility, Hitler gives the A-4 rocket development program top priority and premier access to resources. The A-4 will now become the V-1 and later its successor V-2. V for Vergeltungswaffe, weapon of vengeance. But to get there, the rocket scientists will need new production and assembly facilities spread throughout the country, one near the Peenemünde Research Center itself. To build them, they desperately need Hitler's promised resources, a promise to be fulfilled through the hard labor by Polish and Soviet prisoners from subcamps of Ravensburg concentration camp, Karlshagen II, and Trassenheide. To the Nazis, expendable lives of lesser humans who, without qualms, can be worked to death, building factories to produce even more death. And so, the cylinders of war and a motor fueled by hatred and division spin ever faster, driving on the cogwheels that are chewing more and more people into this cycle of death. 
does then the passing of two individuals like Jean Moulin and Vladislav Sikorsky really matter that much? After all, they are just two people out of countless thousands who died this week. But I do think they might matter a little more. Not in the way that every individual human life matters, but for humanity as a whole. Because they have become more than individuals. They have taken on the burden of leadership to become icons of resistance against evil, beacons of hope for entire peoples yearning for an end to this madness. They have fought on the very top of the barricades, raised in desperation to protect the ideas of liberty, self-determination, and security. Now, in death, they have taken on another role that will long outlast them. Through their sacrifice, part of their cause has been immortalized. They are not alone. They now live on in a pantheon populated by they who in life and beyond have paid the ultimate price so that we, you, and I can have better futures to look forward to. Let us not waste what they have given us. Never forget. Thank you.